Please welcome panel moderator, CEO of All Inclusive Marketing, Sarah Bundy. Hey, you guys. All right, checking this out. Can you guys hear me all right? Cool, great to see all of your awesome, happy, wonderful faces today. Uh, welcome to Why Big Media is Thriving with Performance Marketing. We've got an exciting uh, conversation for you guys today and some wonderful panelists. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Sarah Bundy, uh, founder and CEO of All Inclusive Marketing. We are a full service affiliate management company that helps brands reach, engage, and convert, which we'll be speaking about today, um, their online uh, buyers, online and offline buyers through a variety of different partnerships. So um, I'm going to let Neela introduce herself. We'll go down the line, and we've got some really cool questions that we're going to discuss with you guys today. Awesome. So I'm Neela Ali. I'm the VP of Strategic Partnerships at BuzzFeed. I'm Leilani Han, head of BD and Partnerships at Wirecutter. I'm Jacqueline Walatis, um, Senior Commerce Partnerships Manager for Condé Nast. Yeah. So um, a lot of what we're seeing today is a lot of buzz around how to work with content commerce partners. Uh, lots of people are trying to diversify their affiliate portfolios. We need to expand and reach new audiences. Obviously, KPIs and ROI is still a consideration. And there's a lot of different nuances and differences between how different content partners actually work, what's important to them, what kind of object objectives they have, how that ties into your goals and objectives. So we're going to dig into some of those things today. And let's start, first start with the question, what are the major benefits that an advertiser would have in working with a mass media partner um, or a content commerce partner such as yourselves? Yeah, so I think when we're functioning in this time where there's attention deficit, there's so many places where people are consuming content, it's really important to get your brand and your brand message in front of an audience who's tuned in and interested um, in the content publisher's recommendations. Um, what we found is that just from an efficiency standpoint, when we write about a brand, we see that the reach that we have at BuzzFeed is really impactful for the advertisers that we're featuring because at the end of the day, when you're promoting through your own channels, your reach is only as small as kind of your existing audience and maybe a lookalike audience, but we at BuzzFeed have such massive scale. Um, so we also have found that consumers' buying habits are just changing. People are increasingly researching before they're buying something. They really want to find the best of the product. So when your product is showing up across many publishers and it's kind of validating that is, in fact, the best choice, that increases that chance of conversion or at least high intent, which you can ultimately retarget with through your own channels or eventually that person will be inspired to purchase your products. Yeah, and what about you guys? I mean, I think another really nice thing about it is it definitely makes the products that you have in your brand a little bit more personal. You know, compare somebody shopping on their own and looking at, you know, a, a tile of, all these similar products versus actually reading about it and understanding the, and like the use cases with Wirecutter, with the product reviews that we have. If you guys have actually spent the time to read through all of the 7,000 to 10,000 words of our reviews, mm -hmm. you'll find that there's so much information when we really dig into like how people are using it in addition to the various like objective attributes of it. So um, it definitely brings that more personal feel coming from an authoritative voice that makes people feel good about what they're buying. Yeah, I think for us also, piggybacking kind of off what Neela said, the, the influence that these content brands have and these mass media partners have, some of which have been around for over a century, impacts the branding overall so much. Like, especially seeing with Vogue, um, just getting you know one product pick into a Vogue summer sandals guide, not only is that really driving revenue and really um, driving sales and clicks and traffic and all those things we like to see, but you also have that branding value of being a Vogue pick and the leader in fashion. And I think that goes for like, any of you guys up here, any of the titles at Condé Nast, they're all real leaders in the field and have this power to influence the consumer and say, this is the trend, this is what we're doing, we're setting the trend, um, and your brand could be a part of that. Yeah, and what we find when we're managing um, programs for clients and we're looking at different types of content partnerships, different types of media partnerships, you guys are all very different from each other. In some cases, um, people might group media as like one type of publisher, but actually within that, there's so many different types. In the case of Jacqueline, she's got Condé Nast, where you've got GQ Magazine and Vogue Magazine and Wired Magazine, and there's a, a really long list of um, properties that they have control over for different audiences, for different types of demographics for different life situations and milestones that people are consider it's part of the consideration phase, but there's also an opportunity to drive them further down the funnel from awareness and consideration, discovery, research, 
to acceptance and wanting to move forward with the purchase. And interestingly, with uh, media partners and content partners, we find that there's a lot of control and impact that uh, we see from the contributions that uh, editorial types of partnerships and content commerce types of partnerships can bring that are very unique to the space. So we know what the benefits are for the advertisers, which is great. Brand exposure, trust, you're now best in class, you're a market leader, you're getting that exposure, revenue is coming in. But what are the KPIs that are most important to you guys? Because obviously, if an advertiser is going to work with you, they need to align to the things that are most important to you. Like, what are your goals and objectives when you select working with an advertiser? What KPIs are you responsible for measuring and delivering upon so that as we approach you, we know what to, to contextualize as we approach you in an opportunity to work together? For us at Wirecutter, the main thing that we're looking at, every single piece of content that we produce has an EPC against it. We know for any given category or any given page the financial health of that piece. And so I think what's really interesting is when we have conversations with advertisers, and you guys obviously have your return on ad spend efficiency goal that you're looking at, and we're, we have the same thing as well. That's our efficiency goal. And there's a lot of other KPIs that, are, that go you know, back into that, right? I think commission rate is certainly one thing, and I really appreciate that so many of the advertisers in this space now understand the need that we have for a premium rate, but it doesn't just stop there. We also are very interested in understanding, like, well, what kind of work are you doing with other content publishers, and what is the conversion rate that you have against it? I mean, 100% commission rate on 0% conversion is still, at the end of the day, $0. So we look at all of those factors, and we try to measure that against if somebody's going to be trying to optimize with us or work with us for the first time, knowing that we already have our efficiency metric. Like, are you going to be an incremental upside, or are you going to be an opportunity cost? And so that's how we think about it. Yeah, I mean, earnings per click for us is really one of the most, probably the most important thing, because conversion rate, average order value, and commission rate all factor in. And there are some brands that can't offer a 15% CPA or a 20% CPA, but their site converts so well that we don't need that high CPA because we have those metrics. So it really all comes down to seventh grade algebra for us. <laughs> um, like we're so bullish about data and I have an algebra equation posted at my desk that I should, I'm never asking someone for a commission rate that I'm just kind of pulling out of thin air. It's always, you know, I know that these placements will drive X amount of clicks, and I know in order to get the earnings per click, we need to justify this amount of um, links that we're giving you in real estate, we're giving you in these properties, we need a certain CPA to hit that earnings per click. So we measure it a little differently. We look at it at earnings per view. Um, and our reasoning for doing that is we kind of try to find content pieces that can be leveraged as an asset that we can amplify through our social channels and on-site channels. Um, just given the amount of content that we're kind of constantly producing, there's a lot of posts that either perform above or below benchmark, and we want to create the opportunity for the brands that are featured in that post to do more with the content that's really successful. So it's basically the same thing as EPC. We just kind of go a layer higher and look at it from a view standpoint. But at the end of the day, conversion is our most important metric because that to us is a signal that the brand is resonating with our audience in a way that's actually delivering a service. If a brand's not converting, that means the audience doesn't like the product, and it doesn't benefit BuzzFeed, nor the partner, nor the audience for us to write about things that they're not, that the audience isn't interested in. So at the end of the day, conversion's like the core KPI, but that ultimately backs into things like EPC and EPV, which helps us make business decisions that allow us to scale the business. Yeah, and with that in mind, when, when an, uh, an advertiser comes and approaches you, how do you pick and choose which ones to say yes to versus no to strictly from a KPI perspective when you're analyzing the objectives that you're trying to accomplish? Is it more that this story fits into an editorial? Is it more that you've looked at the stats and you've talked about the numbers and the math makes sense on both sides? Is it strictly that they have paid search budget and if they pay you, you'll, you'll do a post? Like, How are you picking and choosing yes and no in different situations when an advertiser does approach you? Yeah, I, that, um, I love the merchant choice question. So um, everything with Condé Nast, you know, a lot of our Vogue first published in, I think, 1892. It's been around forever. And the biggest, most important part and pillar of our strategy is that everything is editorial and it's organic. You cannot buy your way into Vogue, at least through the affiliate channel. You can certainly go to our branded sales and content team, drop 100K, get a dedicated article. Um, but you cannot, through the affiliate channel, buy your way into these properties. It's all organic, it's all editorial, so it's a huge um, combination of 
I meet with the director of fashion at Vogue.com regularly to find out, okay, what are the trends? What are the brands you like? How are we going to optimize with those? And a lot of who we work with comes from the editors requesting to work with them, um, me keeping a pulse on what the trends and what the editors want to write about, and then also coming down to EPC. And that's kind of the final step is making sure we're at the right commission rate once we've vetted you and made sure that editors will actually include you and write about you guys. So actually, that's a really good lead into the next question, which is really what is the best way to approach content and mass media partners? Because um, if if you can't buy your way in, in some cases, and it's affiliates, performance based, and you're sort of tying it into your content calendar, um, and in your case, actually, uh, with Condé Nast having a lot of different properties with a lot of different audiences and a lot of different editorial teams, a lot of different content calendars, like who are you supposed to approach to? ask, is it you individually? Is it the editor directly? Is there another team? When do you approach them? Is it like the week before you throw a, a new product release or a promotion? Is it the quarter during your content planning? So how far in advance should advertisers be reaching out? And then really, how do they do it? Is it like, what's the approach? What do they say? In some cases, some people have pre-written content that they like to go to uh, content partners with. But in the case of mass media and editorial, you don't take that approach because there's some another way and you write your own headlines and you write your own editorial pitches and you don't need pre-written content. So tell us a little bit about like the, the who and the how and the when of the best way to go about reaching out and uh, uh, touching base and getting that kind of desired placement that will produce the results that both sides are looking for. So we really operate on a commerce cycle. So I'd say most of the tentpole shopping events that retailers are aware of is what we're likely writing about because that's what consumers want to see. Um, everything we do, to Jackie's point, is editorial. We really work on the heels of the editorial team because if we don't operate in that way, again, nobody wins. That being said, we all know there's millions of options of brands to write about. There's different retailers that you can link to when featuring a product. There is a lot of strategy that goes into play. And somewhat missed opportunity if the edit team were to just kind of operate in silo and never listen to new opportunities, we wouldn't be servicing all audiences who are maybe not necessarily shopping from Amazon, but shopping from somewhere else. So we kind of operate in this, like our team kind of works as a middleman or gatekeeper between opportunities from advertisers, communi communicating that to the editorial team, seeing what resonates with them and that they're interested in doing something with or growing. And if there's like a no from the editorial team, we obviously give that feedback back to the retailer. Um, or advertiser, my stance is always, if a publisher says no to you, don't take it personally. It's probably just, it doesn't make sense for that audience. There's also millions of publishers who can tell your story in the best way. And I think anytime it's tried to be forced on a publisher, it, it doesn't tend to go well. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd also say, we might say no in Q1, because it doesn't make sense from a seasonal standpoint. But in Q4, it might actually be a perfect opportunity for gifting, or you might have a Black Friday, Cyber Monday sale. So I'd also say, like, listen to the feedback and then try to find the right time of year that might be relevant for a publisher that you really do want to work with. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, the kind of who would be myself and Jessica on my team. Um, we work as the gatekeepers. We work closely with the editorial team. Um, we really want to make sure we maintain their editorial integrity. So direct lines of communication with advertisers we tr really try to avoid. Yeah. And let's actually talk about editorial integrity to, with both of you guys, too, because Wirecutter is very well known for looking for the most um, authentic, best of best of best, the, the stress tests you guys put on the products that you review and the experiences that you review, the 10,000 words for every single post. Like there's a lot of editorial integrity that you need to maintain and Vogue and GQ and like these brands that have been around for over 100 years that everyone sees in every place they go to. We've gotta be very careful about, you have to be very careful about who you pick and choose. So again, editorial, uh, the, the integrity of the content, but how do we approach you to maintain that integrity and also get our products and our brands picked up by you. I mean, I would say generally speaking, like speaking in broader strokes to try to make this applicable to any other large publisher that you meet, might speak with, I mean, do your homework. Actually spend some time reading through the content. I think once you do that, it becomes pretty clear what their focus is and kind of how they might work with different um, brands. Like if you were to spend time on BuzzFeed, like you can actually see that there are some collaborative pieces that they do with brands. If you spend any time reading Wirecutter, you know that that sort of collaborative effort is pretty much verboten. And so I think like, that would be my, my very first recommendation. And then from there, I mean, leverage your network reps. I mean, they, like most of us here at CJ, ha, uh, like working with CJ have reps and they can give you the intel on how to work with them. But if ever in doubt, definitely go to the BD person first at the publisher because for, by and large, like editorial, like 
really, because of that separation, don't really want to be bothered with that. And then I think for us, for Wirecutter too, just to kind of answer some of the other, uh, to tack onto what you guys were saying, like we are very restricted in that we can only work with the brands that carry the product or service that we recommend, and it must be an exact match. You know, all things, you know, crossing that off uh, the list though, we try to understand like, because we pride ourselves so much on being reader service first, we then take a look at, okay, if there are several different buying options for that one thing, who is going to help us extend this amazing reader experience into a really great buying experience? And that's kind of how we then start to pick and choose. Like there may be a product that's sold at um, a very well-known nationally recognized chain versus a very small mom and pop. And then we start taking a look at the metrics and like what is the buying experience. For Condé Nast, um, editorial integrity is paramount. I've seen strategies go one way where it is revenue first, revenue first, and that doesn't work out for anyone, and, and now those companies don't exist anymore. And so for us, editorial integrity is the biggest pillar of our strategy overall. Um, it's the long burn. I have an editor on my team who's so stringent about it and what he wants to know, so he's the one I ask all my editorial integrity questions. Um, but I basically act as the gatekeeper between as the separation of church and state, right? So, um, hi, I'm, you can email me if you wanna work with Condé Nast. It's my first name, underscore my last name, at condenast.com. And I manage the merchants uh, for affiliate partnerships with all of the titles. And I have relationships with the organic editorial teams at every single title, as well as obviously our commerce editors that we've embedded. Um, and ultimately, no matter who you reach out to at Condé Nast, it'll get bounced back to me eventually, and that's kind of how we keep our separation of church and state um, and make sure that you know the editors know who's optimizing and who we have the partnerships with, but at the end of the day, it's their call on who they want to put into their content. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think the positive news there too is I think oftentimes in the past, there has been this huge separation between editorial and branded content. I think that's starting to shift. So I do think now if, say, BuzzFeed doesn't necessarily want to work with you editorially, we do have stakeholders on the branded side that can help kind of convey that value of your brand or launch a different sort of campaign that's not necessarily editorial but more branded. But we can leverage the best practices of what we're seeing work on the shopping side to kind of craft the messaging of our branded campaigns. So I think there's now more opportunity that it's not like a dead end if we say, no, it doesn't make sense editorially. There's other options and other products that might make sense, um, again, depending on what your KPIs are. So I urge you, whatever publishers you're working with, reach out to the affiliate team. If they say no, try to see if there's other ways into that publisher um, that might still be valuable to you, but not necessarily purely affiliate and editorial. Yeah, and I really want to uncover a little bit more into the, the first steps when we're talking about that editorial and like kind of getting through the right approach and the right message. You guys are the gatekeeper. You have reasons why you might say no. And maybe that reason is that they, you know, it doesn't fit into the, the editorial calendar in that quarter, but it might in Q4. So, and so timing obviously has something to do with it, but I know that actual approach to you makes a difference as well. Can you guys give us an example of like actually what brands should say? Like how do they reach out and what should they say in their email? Do they LinkedIn you? Do they phone? Do they send it to your email? And if they do, like, what captures your attention and it's like, you know what, I'm gonna look into this further versus somebody, like, so like I'm looking for an actual, tell me what to say in the email response when they reach out to you guys. So how do you want people to speak with you when they're approaching you for the first time? We get inundated with emails all the time, as I'm sure you both do. Um, so it's really hard to, first off, respond, respond in a timely manner. So I'd say just persistence is key. If you're not hearing back, it's probably just, it's lost in our inboxes. Beyond that, I think keeping the message as clear as possible and trying not to do our job is what I'd recommend. Oftentimes people reach out with like, a, I think my brand would sound great in this type of a BuzzFeed article. And it's like, that's not my job even, that's the editorial team's job. It's not worth your time to come up with creative headlines. What is helpful is if you can extract where we have written about the brand in the past. Because oftentimes the first thing that Jess and I will do is ask the editorial team, would you write about this brand? And if we can see that they've been written about consistently in content, that's like a positive signal that the editorial team clearly does like this brand. So it's helpful to highlight that in the email. Um, beyond that, our editorial team, usually their like number one check is, does anyone on the team have experience with the product? If yes, we're usually interested in kind of seeing what we can do with that partner. If no, what we heavily rely on is user reviews. 
Um, so I think just helping navigate the site and showing us like that this is like a product that has positive user reviews, people are loving it, this is success we've seen with other publishers, just kind of sharing all that information up front and then having kind of the open call to action of like what can we do together, I think is the most helpful way to kind of move the process along quickly um, and not overwhelm us with outreach that we're like, this doesn't necessarily make sense or feel like it's too forced and we automatically kind of shut or up. Or they're reading a novel or you're reading a exactly. novel just to try and get to the point right. and you, can't, you just right. don't have time so you stop reading the email and move on, right? Exactly. Um, I'd actually love to hear from you guys on the same question if you don't mind. So I was just laughing because please you guys don't try to pitch us a story idea. That's not your job and it's not ours. Yeah. We have a team that does that so please don't. Um, but what I would say is like, well for Wirecutter specifically, like if you do have something that is a fit, like we have written about a product that you carry or what have you, please do reach out to us. I think on top of everything that you were saying though, I mean some of the outreaches or the, the partners that we work with today where we've had so, a really successful relationship are the ones that are able to come to the table to not just with things like a vanity coupon code, but we actually have merchants who will curate deals for us. We have a deals team who is very, very specific and uh, because the core partners that we work with, they know that we can convert and they will basically say, tell us whatever your deal editor wants for a price and we'll give it to you. That's been really successful. Um, we've had other, per, uh, other partners trying to customize experiences for us, um, such as making sure that when they do create a special offer for us, like a consumer like offer um, on, on the deal, that it's actually restricted just to wire cutter readers. Um, and we also have those who are working with us, like being very cognizant of the fact of where we sit in that overall path to purchase and knowing where attribution comes into play and making, like, you know, for those who say that our, the content partners are a really, really large priority, they've shown up with adjusting attribution rules or taking a look at that overall path and, you know, helping to augment any sort of potential loss with, you know, hybrid flat fees or what have you. Um, but those are definitely the ones, the ones who are willing to uh, work with us in those regards uh, catch our attention. I mean, the same, okay. <laughs> you know. And, cool. and if you're emailing me about a new partner, um, make sure you include a link to their homepage. Sounds really basic, but more often than not, I am Googling for things and pulling up the wrong homepages, and so that's really helpful. A great tip, actually, including the link to the page you want them to look at straight in that first email. Yeah. Easy, easy and sometimes overlooked, so good, good reminder. All right, so um, one of the things that actually Neela mentioned was Amazon uh, a couple comments ago, and uh, I think it's worthy of just exploring that a little bit when it comes to working with content partners and mass media. Um, obviously, magazine's a little bit different, but when you have an online presence and there's a lot of content and there's a lot of uh, brands approaching, um, Amazon is a strategy that a lot of content partners use to monetize the site. And for us, um, work, brands that are working directly, that is obviously a challenge, and we wanna work directly with you rather than having to go through Amazon to work directly with you. So can you tell us a little bit about each of you, kind of how does Amazon fit into the mix uh, of your own strategy? Like what is kind of the percentage of Amazon links versus direct brand links? And how would a brand and an advertiser be able to work directly with you more successfully versus having to go to Amazon because it's kind of the easy, obvious solution to monetizing your site? So let's tackle that one a little bit because I know it's a concern for some people. Yeah, I mean, Amazon for us is and will very likely always be one of our biggest partners. Um, it's just where our audience likes to shop. There's a huge overlap between BuzzFeed readers and Prime subscribers. It's something that we can't stop delivering to our audience. That being said, there's definitely consumers out there who aren't Prime members or who aren't necessarily looking for the Amazon experience. I think a lot of direct consumer brands do a great job of telling the story of their brand best through their own channels. And I think it's hard to replicate that directly on Amazon. So we're always willing to drive to a direct -to consumer site. We actually prefer to give the consumer the option. I think the worst case scenario is that we don't link to the site or sorry, to Amazon, only drive to the direct-to-consumer site. A consumer lands there and realizes it's on Amazon. They Google it, they go to Amazon and buy it, and we can never actually capture that attribution window and understand whether or not a piece of content is successful. So oftentimes, we try to take the strategy of linking to both, giving the consumer the option. I think where you can really win in that scenario is by truly having competitive pricing against Amazon. If it's actually cheaper to get your product directly through the site and there is free shipping or easy shipping or free returns, then yes, you will beat out Amazon, and I think that's just like common e-commerce e best practices, but ultimately we need to drive the consumer wherever the experience is best. 
And if we're going to drive them to the direct-to-consumer site and they're paying more for the exact same product, nobody wins in that scenario. Um, so we're always open to it, but we have to keep in mind what's best for the consumer. I think what's really interesting is like when we speak with advertisers asking us to swap out links and you know and we're like. Uh, for, to them directly instead of Amazon, and they don't necessarily stack up in all the things that you were mentioning. It's so funny to me because let's be real, so many of us are actually Amazon Prime shoppers, or you're very familiar with uh, the, the benefits of shopping through Amazon Prime. And so I kind of like to just turn it around on, every, on all of the people trying to work with us and asking them, like, well, what are the reasons why you shop through Amazon Prime? If you have a choice, why would you shop through them? And then just take a very critical look at what you're offering to the actual consumer and to our reader, and how do you stack up against that? I think it's when advertisers can actually be very honest and self-aware about where how they can be competitive or where they might be deficient is where they can start to understand how they might be able to be more competitive and start working directly with us. And when there are those deficiencies that you may not have that immediate control over, that's when we start taking a look at, again, it kind of goes back to are you incremental upside or are you an opportunity cost? And we do have a couple of partners who are more than willing to help us make up that gap through flat fees. Um, Amazon is part of our strategy. It's not the biggest part. It certainly is bigger for other titles over besides others. You know, obviously Wired and Ars Technica do well with Amazon, but Vogue, it's like a drop in the bucket. Um, I think, and looking overall, it kind of comes down to the earnings per click that we get from Amazon. So I get a lot of people asking, well, what's Amazon's commission rate? That doesn't really matter. Um, because they have such a high conversion rate and um, the and people are constantly checking out on there, that is really what plays into them having the earnings per click that they do. That being said, the earnings per click on Amazon is high, but it's not unattainably high. Um, and if you want that direct traffic, it is going to be a hefty commission increase, but not one that will break the bank and that we can work that out. So it's just good for us to be aware, I think, as we're approaching uh, content and media partnerships, that that is something to take into consideration. Take a look at your sites and make sure that whatever you're offering can be competitive so that it's appealing, at least as an apples to apples comparison, because we do want to be able to, to have the opportunity to work directly with. So, and there's a lot of success in working directly with, and we're seeing a lot of success uh, in working with mass media partners and content commerce partners directly. So let's uh, shift gears super quick. I know we're running short on time here, but maybe we can just kind of fly through. Give us an example, if you wouldn't mind, of like how uh, a, you've worked directly with a brand and it's proven to drive revenue. Yep. Revenue, we're looking for revenue in the door with a direct brand, and why does it work? Like, how did it work? Yeah, um, I think a good example of this is back in 2018, we did a post about ritual vitamins. Um, and we actually, at the time, didn't include links in the post. It went live, and they started to see a huge influx of traffic and sales um, coming from what they then identified as being this piece of content. So from there, what we decided to do was add affiliate links and test whether scaling that piece of content by driving more traffic to it through social would actually result in incremental sales and maintain that efficiency. Um, and the really exciting thing is it did. Um, what we also have done is um, a lot of our advertisers are opening up their Facebook limited conversion pixel to BuzzFeed so that when we're optimizing on social, we can actually optimize towards conversions and not just views. It has implications for click costs. They do typically double, um, but we're optimizing towards the right KPI, so you're paying for the right action. Um, so we've kind of taken that model and applied it to a lot of our posts where we see if something's converting really well, we find the most efficient way to drive traffic to it. Um, and it continues to be a really highly efficient kind of asset for our advertisers to use. Thank you, Mila. Um, I'm thinking about one kind of up-and-coming multi-merchant e-commerce brand where we did a couple, we have a couple of you know, key drivers to success. Um, those who can actually work with us and actually get the share voice on the buy buttons on our guides and reviews and can also curate deals, which does allow us to give them a little bit more visibility through so, you know, play, like our deals page, which is one of the most highly trafficked pages of our site, um, and some other, and other pages on the site. Um, they were able to come to the table. They came up on the commission rate. We were able to put them in front of our audience where we had never worked with them before. And the revenue not only went from here to, to here, but they love working with us because we drive an 80% new to file customer rate. So uh, that was a really great win for us on all sides. We, um, in January, had a mattress incubator in One World Trade where we called in 30 
bed and box mattresses and um, editors from eight titles tested the mattresses. Uh, so the really the best mattresses got a lot of share of voice across multiple titles and GQ in particular and Wired published uh, like the second weekend of February. Their SEO strategy was really strong um, and they both had the same number one pick, which was Helix. Um, Helix is the best mattress, guys. Yeah. I sleep on an all 12, but it's fine. Um, and so they, we have now driven, I mean, it's millions of dollars in sales for Helix because of those two placements that went live in February and we're still seeing huge sales numbers in September. And those are direct relationships? Those are direct relationships, relationships. Awesome. yeah. Cool. Um, so we're gonna wrap up here with just some next steps that you guys suggest to the audience in working with uh, mass media partners and content partners. What are like one or two things that you'd suggest these guys do like right off the bat once they walk out this room? I think kind of to Leilani's point, sorry to steal it, but it's really do your research, identify which publishers can tell your story the best and where your product makes the most sense and reach out to those publishers again, in a way that's really actionable and clear and kind of helps them un understand why your product is right for their audience um, and be persistent. I think when you hear no, like take that seriously because it's also really annoying when people <laughs> keep trying to reach out and we've expressed why it doesn't make sense to work with them. Um, but if it's like a no but, really follow up on that but and make sure you find the right opportunities. Cool. On top of that, be cognizant of the fact that we are business owners or representatives of our businesses as well. We have efficiency goals that we also need to, uh, to meet. So where can we work together to meet in the middle? And also, please do a critical self-assessment of, of your own affiliate program. Is this something, like if you were a consumer on the other side, would you buy through your own site for those products? Would you buy it somewhere else? And if that's the case, if it's the latter, why? Yeah, and I think also just, I know Neil mentioned, but we get inundated with hundreds of emails a day please be understanding if we don't get back to you in the immediate term. Um, I've gotten like four or five emails within a week from the same person and then they'll loop my boss in and, and be like, I don't know if Jackie's still on your team or not and it's just not fun for anyone. It's just awkward and my boss is like, eh, maybe don't respond to them at the end of the day. They're gonna be like this. So just be, please be understanding. <laughs> Can I get one last one? Absolutely, go for it. Uh, I'd also highly urge everyone to reassess how they measure success through the affiliate channel when working with content publishers, because I think that's typically the most frustrating thing, having worked at BuzzFeed and at Time Inc. in the past, is we oftentimes are driving a lot of discoverability and ultimate conversion, but we're not necessarily getting credit for it. But we're looked at still as kind of that last click attribution model, which I think, again, results in a space that no one wins, because neither parties can scale around something that's actually working. Um, so I just take a second think about how you're evaluating your affiliate channel in regards to content publishers. Love it, all great advice, great perspective, great insights, really thank you guys so much. If anyone wants to stay, we'll open the floor actually to some questions, um, just for a couple of minutes. I know some people have some meetings, but let's do like two or three questions and uh, we've got some, some pretty great people here you can ask, so do we have any questions? Hi, on some of your um, websites, we do have existing content for many of our advertisers already. And when we're talking about coming back around to the seasons again, you know, whether it's Q4, or Q1, you know, new year, new you, how do we work with your team to potentially amplify already existing content on your site so we don't have to go through the whole editorial process again? Um, I think it depends on what the coverage is. Some coverage will be outdated, and I think it's not, it's not efficient for your dollars to go towards something that isn't necessarily the best and newest um, story of your brand. That being said, again, amplification we found to be highly efficient, so I think it's just a conversation about what are those content pieces. I will say for BuzzFeed specifically, a lot of our gift guides that are newer get the bulk of the traffic. We have less of an SEO play, so everything we do really is about social amplification, so new content will get more organic views. I think it's obviously different when chatting with players who are more SEO optimized. Um, but I think we're always open to that conversation, but we want to make sure you, you're using your investment in the best way. Right, yeah. I'm afraid that we are actually out of time, so we'll have to end it here, but you're welcome to come up and ask questions directly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, ladies. Thank you.